Hey guys, Dr. Cummings here from Point Loma Nazarene. Uh, what I want to talk about now is the concept of continuous culture. This is the idea of when microbes have unlimited resources. So resources are not being depleted. Uh, if they're being used up, they're being replenished just as quickly. So there's no limiting resources and waste products that are being generated are, uh, are removed. So you don't have this increasing toxicity like you would have in a closed system or a batch system. So you're not running out of nutrients and you're not building up waste products. So we're going to talk a little about some basic principles of continuous culture. We're going to talk about the chemostat, which is the main tool uh, in the laboratory that we use to grow bacteria in continuous culture. And then we'll look at some of the uses, some of the ways we might apply something like uh, a chemostat for studying microorganisms. So continuous culture is an, an open system, like I said before. It's an open system microbial culture. Uh, the volume is fixed. So as we're adding new resources, our volume is not getting larger and larger because that would be unsustainable. So the idea of a continuous culture is that we're going to keep adding nutrients, and at the same time we're going to remove volume that removes waste and dead cells at the same time. So we keep a fixed volume in our system, and theoretically you could run this thing infinitely. Uh, in reality, they're tough to run. Uh, they get contaminated easily, and, and there's there are hiccups. But um, in theory, you could run a, a continuous culture forever because your microbes are constantly growing. The chemostat, think about that, chemo, chemical, stat, steady. So we're keeping the, the chemical um, makeup of the system steady throughout. So it's not changing like it does in a batch system because, again, we're not depleting resources and increasing waste products. This is the most common type of continuous culture device that's used for research. And we're able to control two key factors. Uh, the growth rate, in other words, the, the, oh, the doubling time of the population. And although, and keep in mind that the population, even though there's binary fission taking place at some particular rate that we're controlling, uh, that the, the population size is not increasing. Uh, because we're getting rid of old cells as we're going along. And so this is a way for the bacteria to stay in exponential growth and continue to grow and double without actually increasing the total biomass, uh, which would just take over the planet. If you ever sit down and do the, the exponential growth calculations, you can see that, that if it was allowed to continue to grow and, and the, the population size and the volume continue to increase and expand, it would consume planet Earth in a matter of days, right? So um, so we can control the growth rate and the population density, the steady state population density. So the instantaneous growth rate, meaning for any one cell, how long does it take for that cell to become two, and the population density, how many cells per milliliter are we holding steady at? Now think about how unusual this is, right? Uh, it sounds similar to stationary phase, doesn't it, in a batch culture? Except in stationary phase, some limiting nutrient is now gone, and so very few cells are able to, to uh, grow and divide, and just as many that divide are dying, and there are waste products that have accumulated. And so when we're in a steady state or stationary phase in a batch culture, those cells physiologically are no longer in exponential growth. Whereas in a chemostat, we do reach a steady state population density, but because of the design, the bacteria are still doubling, meaning that there's still an exponential growth physiologically. And it turns out that a lot of what we want to know about how bacteria behave requires us to be culturing them um, in an exponential growing phase. If they're sitting around in a dormant phase, lots of things change in terms of their metabolism, their physiology, their gene expression. Uh, and so a chemostat's a really cool tool for keeping your bacteria essentially perpetually in exponential phase. So how do we, how do we control the growth rate, the instantaneous uh, growth rate for like a single cell to become two cells? And how do we control that population density? And we can control them um, independently of each other and at the same time, depending on the dilution rate, okay? So flow versus culture volume. So we're going to see in a minute when I show you the device, as new fresh nutrients are dripping in at a particular rate for the given volume, 
However fast or slow we're replenishing those nutrients is going to determine the instantaneous growth rate of the, the population. It'll be the average instantaneous growth rate of all the cells within that population. So not only could we keep them just growing like gangbusters, just doubling every 20 minutes if we have a really high growth rate, we can actually have a really, really low dilution rate that uh, that essentially mimics starvation conditions where the bacteria then we're controlling them now right are only dividing every you know 24 hours or every six days or every month and we can begin to imitate real conditions out in nature uh, and then we can control the the density the steady state density of the culture x number of cells per milliliter in that steady state while the continuous culture is running by controlling the concentration of a limiting nutrient and the amount the actual concentration of that limiting nutrient will determine whether we have a very high or a very low steady state um, population density so let's say our limiting nutrient is our carbon source maybe it's glucose if we want our cell density to be very very low we can provide them with very very little glucose along the way if we want a really high heavy dense culture we can provide them with a lot of glucose if in fact that's the uh, the the limiting nutrient for their growth and then this term steady state, I keep mentioning it. Let's make sure we define it. Cell density and substrate, substrate concentration, uh, right, chemostat, don't change over time. So once, um, once a chemostat is set up and running, we can get it to steady state. And if all goes well, provided there are no hiccups, we can keep it in that steady state at that, uh, that constant population density, that constant instantaneous growth rate, with a uh, by controlling the the drip the flow rate and the substrate concentration we can keep it that way for in perpetuity right so what does this device look like this is a, a typical looking um, chemostat here right you've got some sort of a, a a vessel that has your culture growing in it there's a head space to it that has the appropriate gas whether that's atmosphere uh, with oxygen or if it's an anaerobic culture you might put something inert like nitrogen in there if they need a certain amount of co2 for carbon fixation uh, or for um, for ph buffering we might control that as well it's a variety of things we can control in here over here this is the culture vessel there are lots of tubes and and dials and controls uh, all connected to it but here are the key ones right so here's our vessel and we have uh, fresh sterile medium from our reservoir. The reservoir is usually like a carboy sitting on the ground here. We've got a peristaltic pump that's dripping it in at a particular drip rate. Now how do we take it out? You could also set a, another peristaltic pump to be taking it out at exactly the same rate, um, but if you're off even by a fraction, your volume over time is either going to grow or it's going to shrink. So instead what's simpler is to take an overflow tube that um, that essentially for every drip from your fresh medium that comes in one drip will overflow into the overflow uh, effluent and it'll go into some kind of a container sometimes we'll have um, we'll have bleach in that container just be killing them but a waste container so what we're removing think about it what we're removing is dead cells live cells waste products some nutrients yeah uh, everything that's in there but we're removing it volume for volume and we're replacing it with fresh media. Okay, so for every milliliter that comes in, a milliliter is going to go out. That creates space. It creates um, new opportunities, you could think of it that way, for microorganisms to grow and divide. And remember, whatever our key limiting nutrient is, whether that's phosphorus, nitrogen, iron, glucose, whatever it happens to be, that concentration is controlled in your fresh medium reservoir. And you've got a flow rate regulator, and it's usually not a little hand job like this. It's, a, it's something that you're going to control digitally, so you're very, very precise. We can really control these precisely. Something else that's going on in this image that's not shown in the diagram here is that over time, this, uh, this um, solution can become acidic or basic depending on the physiology of the microorganisms and so we'll often have pH probes down in the solution giving feedback to a couple more peristaltic pumps that'll have uh, a base 
and an acid. And it'll go back and forth, a little drop of HCl or a drop of NaOH, and to keep your pH in a particular range that you set. Otherwise, your pH could get really wonky. Uh, sometimes there'll be an oxygen probe in here, and the oxygen probe, you can read it and, and see if the oxygen's staying saturated or if it's going anaerobic and whether that's behaving the way you want it to. There's also a gas being bubbled in sterilely, aseptically. That gas could be air, it could be pure oxygen, or it might be some other gas like an inert gas like nitrogen if you're growing. Anaerobes might be a mix with carbon dioxide to make sure that's available either for buffering or for, um, for autotrophy. So we've got a lot of things that we've got to control in here. There's often a stir bar sitting on a, a a, a stir plate to try to keep things as homogeneous in that vessel as possible so we don't get some cells, for example, clumping and falling out. And all of a sudden we've got a heterogeneous system that's going to be much harder to control. So essentially what we do with all of this is once we've got it up and running, we can keep this thing running for the longest period. You can have a sampling port set up or you can use your effluent as your sampling port, but you can grab samples and do whatever analysis you need to be able to do and know that they're right there in exponential phase all the time. If, if you need exponentially growing cells all the time, this is the way to go. If you want to study things like starvation or nutrient limitation or oxygen limitation, pH alterations, you want to study long-term evolution of microorganisms and look at genetic changes as you put selective pressures on them. You can keep them steadily growing for a long, long period of time, and this is the system to do it with. What are some experimental uses? These are things I've already mentioned. You can maintain exponential growth phase for weeks or months, right, indefinitely in theory, depending on whether you can keep it from the system from mechanically having trouble or from having uh, contamination. We use it to study physiology. Like I said, physiology is often best understood during exponential phase. We study microbial ecology. You can take two microbes and look at competition over time. Uh, evolution, changes in DNA sequences over time. You take yeast and starve them for glucose and see what happens genetically. Do we start getting uh, yeast transporters or duplication events, for example? A variety of genetic changes based on those selective pressures. And you can take samples from nature, like soil or water, and you can enrich and isolate bacteria over the long, slow haul instead of just taking a soil or water sample, putting it straight on a plate, or putting it straight into a batch broth. You can slowly but surely work those, um, those selective and differential properties of the medium to get exactly what it is that you're wanting to study and what you're after. And we talked about that growth rate being controlled by the dilution rate. That actually factors in for a variety of experimental uses where we want to see bacteria growing really rapidly or really slowly as well. Let's go ahead and summarize the key points here of our chemostat and this concept of an open, continuous culture system. It refers to microbial growth in an open system. Let's see if I can move that. I can. It refers to open growth, uh, microbial growth in an open system, so nutrients are replenished and wastes waste products and cells are being removed. The chemostat's most common tool for growing microbes in continuous culture. It allows the user to control both the growth rate of the population as well as the steady state cell density, which it turns out having control over those two features gives you a lot of power in the laboratory to study these microbes. And it also allows the user to study bacteria in exponential growth phase rather than capturing them in stationary phase or even in death phase like we often end up doing either intentionally or accidentally in a batch system. So let me leave you with one thought. Does a batch closed system better represent an infection, let's say, than an open system? Or does the open system better represent an infection? Let's take, um, let's take a urinary tract infection. Okay, so we've got uh, a bladder infection. We've got microbes, let's say it's E. coli, growing on the lining of the bladder, causing pain, discomfort, dizziness, nausea, all kinds of wonderful things. What's the best way to conceptualize that? In a closed batch system or with a continuous culture open system? I'll leave you with that thought. Thanks, guys.